So welcome uh, everyone uh, to our second um, uh, Creatures Seminar. Um, uh, maybe for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Creatures yet, Creatures is a Horizon 2020 funded uh, European project that is uh, starting from the premise that creative practices have very much a very big uh, yet totally untapped potential in fostering socio-ecological uh, transformation. So the aim of the project is uh, to try to understand how this uh, uh, potential, what is constitu constituting this potential and uh, how to make the contribution of, uh, of creative practices more um, uh, uh, like efficient, like, but also like uh, more uh, understood without it being uh, instrumentalized. Um, with this series of uh, seminars, we try to involve both like uh, creatures, researchers and creative practitioners in, that are part of the consortium, uh, as well as external experts to contribute their own views in how they think this transformation is happening and, and what we can do to bring it further. Um, so today we have a kind of like full creature sessions with uh, not one, but three uh, experimental productions that are uh, taking place in the framework of the project. Uh, all of them are based in uh, Helsinki and are supported by uh, the Alto University. Um, that is also the coordinator of, uh, of the project. Um, so in the three, uh, um, XP's is the Baltic Sila by Julia uh, Open Forest by Andrea Botero and uh, Marketa Dolesova, and uh, the Fashion Confession to the Sea by Nam uh, And with that introduction, I give the word to Andrea that can say a few words uh, for the lab. Thanks a lot. Hello, thank you all for being here. We are doing today this experimental seminar actually some of us are in the place where our experimental production is happening you can see from marqueta number two screen the entry to the to the baltic sea lab we have gotten a shopping a commercial space in a shopping center next to our university which was empty uh, for displaying hidaka ohmu which is uh, one of julia lohman's uh, seaweed sculptures uh, the shopping or this shop commercial area has long windows, as you can see from the images from Marqueta's camera, uh, uh, facing both the street and the shopping center. Uh, so we thought this would be a great opportunity to have some some interactions on the on the pandemic circumstance. Marqueta is now showing us some of the previous uh, seaweed sculptures that Julia has been uh, working with in the past. And now you can see Hiraka uh, of Mu uh, uh, in all its uh, splendor. Uh, this experimental production now uses Hiraka of Mu as a, as a background uh, to discuss more in deep some of the work of, of Julia, who my sister will show us <laughs> now doing some Chinese, Chinese theater uh, shadow performance inside <laughs> Hiraka Ohu. So there we have uh, Julia and, and uh, the seaweed pavilion. Hello, Julia. How are you? And then there's the, you can see the, 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 the view to the plaza from the and our faculty is a little bit to the left. And um, some nice views from the, from the seaweed construction. So you can, you can uh, uh, get a glimpse of the place and probably then ask uh, Julia a little bit more questions uh, about the purpose later. Then we also have in the space today, uh, uh, Namkyu, uh, who's uh, uh, working on a small engagement activity uh, relating to fashion confessions to, to the sea. My Manamki would also tell us a little bit about that in a little while. And to the right, we also have Ada Peireti, uh, 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 also part of the team, uh, helping Julia set up the, the Baltic Sea lab. 
Uh, so as you can see, we have some little spaces for for working uh, quite distant uh, from each other, respecting all the uh, co Corona uh, regulations. And last but not least, it's around 200 square meters, I think, uh, the, the space. It used to host a, a hardware store before it got them. And now uh, this little corner where Marketa is walking through uh, host a little uh, installation uh, about the open forest. This is uh, an experimental production. Marqueta, myself, together with Christina, Jazz, and Anna Tikia would be working later in the spring. And these are now so just some sketches uh, of the of the place. We have some of our material, the research articles, and and things we have gathered to work. And now there's Marqueta, and we can we can start the 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 program with this uh, small tour to the place so now you you see how it looks um, and and uh, where are we sitting today uh, to start with uh, i would like to uh, start asking uh, julia uh, to to tell us uh, a little bit about the experimental production she's uh, uh, setting up uh, with the Baltic Sea Lab uh, together. Hello, everyone. Yes, welcome to the Hidaka Umu. We are inside a sculpture right now. And the idea is uh, I built this sculpture last year, uh, last Christmas, almost exactly this time. It was almost finished. And then I took it to the World Economic Forum in Davos to have a space of respite from the kind of uh, conference center for the delegates where they could feel like they're in nature even though they're within that very artificial space. So the idea was it was exactly built like this in front of a window. In uh, Davos the window led to a snow-covered courtyard. Here it leads to the beautiful Alto building. Um, and then in a way the, the Omo itself gave shelter from the rest of the humanly designed uh, stuff in this conference hall. And I also had um, a department of seaweed uh, workshop area in the same space where people could engage making with seaweed and with kind of making their own brooches. And through that engagement and making, they were actually starting to have a dialogue around, you know, what is seaweed? Why does it matter? Why could it be useful to use more of this material? And, I think this is in a way at the core of what, how I would like to use and um, kind of creative practices to use them as a tool to engage people to have dialogues about what kind of futures we would like to have and to speculate together about these futures, but to also then in a way not speculate about the dark futures that we hear in the news every day, but about the ones, the possibilities, the ones we could come together around and push towards futures with a pool that make us engage and share some of our knowledge and make us realize that we are sharing values with people and that it's not competition but collaboration if we're trying to push for these futures together. So um, when Andrea and I were talking about these kind of creative practices, she told me about the Creatures Project and then I was like, okay, this sounds really perfect. Um, and in a way, the idea was that there is kind of this other level of reflecting on the practice that enables us to see what works and how does it work and how can we scale this? Because I think scaling is um, always a very tricky issue with creative practices because you have the, the artist authorship, you have a very localized practice that really is embedded in one place, but that might offer a possibility also for other places, but you have to adapt it, you have to kind of recreate it and find a way of doing so without infringing on anybody's copyright without you know with a more sharing mindset so we set out to do that and i framed the project called the baltic sea lab which is around the baltic sea and the the idea is there's none of this seaweed that i normally use in the baltic it's all different kinds of algae but i think there are many issues with this um most shallow of all seas that uh, uh, we have eutrophication, we have ocean acidification, we have, you know, a lot of toxicity, we have a lot of problems. 
And we have a lot of um, people around the Baltic who are already engaged in solving some of these problems. And I now would like to use the Baltic Sea Lab to bring together the scientists who are actually addressing a lot of the issues around the, around the Baltic and might know how to address them and um, people in local communities who feel they really want to do something. And I want to use creative practices to identify people who would uh, be happy to become sea stewards and to then empower them and try and help them to engage with the ocean or with the sea, with their local sea in a much more constructive way. So not scare anybody, but actually give people tools to address the changes they really want to see and, and would like to, yeah, would like to enact. Thank you, Julia. You also have a kind of like a, a very strong approach to materiality, the, the, not only Hidaka of Mu, but of kinds of the materiality that you engage people with when you're doing the workshops and the smell of the sea. Uh, uh, what do you, how do you think that materiality plays in in uh, in the role that creative practices bring to sustainability well i think i think it's actually very important because we are material beings and i i sometimes feel that through touching materials we're very grounded we're very much kind of uh an an experiential animal almost we're like part of the world we're touching it we're sensing it we're smelling it the minute we're going into an abstraction and the minute you know then then the humans are really unique they're really their own kind of in their own space humans are the strangest of all animals but we really have managed to look into the future and look into the past look into the microsphere and into the big macro macrosphere uh, through our language and science and so forth but through our touching and our being in this world we are just one of many species that co-inhabit on this planet. And I think that feeling of just being one of many, of being part of a bigger web of life and being responsible for a lot of changes, not just to the human realm, but to all of the species we are with us. Um, I mean, that, that feeling of connecting with the non-human others is what's important and at the core. And I think the materiality also does something else. Materials are, pulling your thoughts both into the past and to the future in a very unique way. Because especially natural materials, if you have seaweed, it still is seaweed. You're thinking of the ocean. You're thinking, when you smell it, you think of a bodily engagement in a natural place. You're thinking, like the, peop the, the stories that are shared are about entanglements with seaweed when swimming, about smelly sea visits where you had to leave the beach because there was too much of it and you know these very engaged practices or else of cuisine of eating it putting that stuff into yourself so so the seaweed itself pulls your thoughts back into this natural uh realm where it comes from and into the future because it's such an unexplored territory still we somehow hunch, have a hunch that it might be one of the future materials that solves some things but when you think design made of seaweed, you don't automatically think of that chair or of that icon. So by not being iconic yet, it enables many different uh, envisionings of different futures. And I think that is the basis for a really, really fruitful dialogue between the participants, between people who, who all think of different pathways. Yeah, thank you for putting it so uh, succinctly. Uh, we, we, I know you have planned some activities uh, to happen in here. Uh, we will hear now soon from Nancy, who has been one. Uh, uh, can you tell uh, for those who are watching what what kinds of engagements you 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 plan to have with others now in the Baltic Sea Lab? Yeah, so we built this year. I, I got a call from the curator of Alto saying. Well, there is this retail space that uh, is not being rented out at the moment. Would you like to build your Omu there? And I think that's in a way already showing the power of building a structure like this, that people know you have this structure and it always requires space, but it always then enables spaces because it requires space. So it's kind of like, so, so then when I was able to build this here, I was like, okay, this is a perfect creature space because yes, we have amazing spaces in the university here. But because of COVID, it's really complicated to 
kind of go there and also in this space is com complicated it's it's just complicated at the moment but we thought that this can be the hub and it can be a real hub for people who are able to come here within the restrictions and it can be a virtual hub in which i am inviting people to have dialogues with me around what needs to be done around what artists might already do and the possibility of sharing their practice or in a way you know uh, continuing their practice in other spaces and other localities and of um, building almost like a toolkit of uh, creative practices that help engage uh, communities. So Ada has made a fantastic drawing that explains what we want to do. I'm going to share it quickly. Here we are. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. So the idea is that the creative practitioners at the bottom right they, in a way, look at, um, no, the, the Baltic Sea Lab looks at what creative practitioners already know and do and in, to engage um, communities. And then we are also looking at creative practitioners who have already worked in an ocean context or kind of sea health context. And we ask them whether it's okay to enact some of their practices and maybe adapt them or enact them. We have to find a framework with which we can kind of share them on basically at the same time we are starting to talk with scientists with the Numenen foundation for example and with scientists had, that i met in sweden for example uh, marine biologists around the topics that need to be dealt with with when it comes to the local kind of seas and then in the second stage so, so we're building this toolkit of creative practices that could be enacted and in the second stage we will go to local communities and see whether we can enact them and see whether we can engage people on these topics and then finally hopefully we get there uh, there is this direct connection between the local sea stewards that we would like to help and um, the scientists so that the sea stewards can be almost like human sensors for the scientists and they can kind of benefit mutually from trying to essentially address the same problems yeah so that's kind of Great. Great. So that's a that's a fantastic uh, uh, um, lead to talk a little bit of Nantius small intervention since it's using also the 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 pavilion as a as a background for for this. Nantiu, would you would you like to uh, walk us through a little bit what you have been thinking with the fashion confession? Of course. Welcome to my confession session. Uh, actually, with the invitation from Julia, I was super excited because I have been, I mean, this is amazing opportunity as a setup and really inspirational for inviting different conversation and like sharing different, I mean, reminder of to the sea. This is such a powerful installation that we are having. So upon this invitation, I, and then I was uh, ha ha having a conference presentation in December, so back then. So I came up with this idea that using this opportunity to uh, have certain engagement, inviting people to share uh, their potential, I mean, imp uh, intentional or unintentional wrongdoings, so-called, I called fashion scenes, because the conference, the presentation that I made was related to the ironic relationship between the responsibility and the authorship of fashion design and uh, that was very much about like the, the clash between like what fashion is and then what the practitioner or insider claim to own and uh, what actually clothes and etc are and then the real responsibility and who care what and all those kind of conflict was in a way like so in a way kind of provocation was what the intention of my presentation on the conference and then using that as a call for participation to the intervention called fashion confession to the sea and sea refers to this installation but at the same time this image of like you know eternal tides comes and goes and washes out your perhaps fashion scenes that you have done and then perhaps this generous nature can help you uh, forget or maybe realize maybe what you have done and then share 
po potential action to make over of whatever they have done. So through the, I can share the also the, the link, first of all, is the catalog that include the abstract of my presentation. And secondly, it's about the, the form, online form that I prepared because of this uh, restricted situation with the COVID, et cetera. So people have been participating anonymously, uh, sharing their first of all sin and then pairing with the makeover action to compensate somehow. So I have been having some ideas and then I plan to further develop uh, some workshop together with, uh, I mean, in different occasion in the future context to uh, prototype these ideas that I got from this uh, stage of action that I'm having with fashion. I mean, this Hidaka Omu and Baltic Sea Lab and all this activity that involved here. Great, thank you. And now, now Marketa and I will, um, yeah, will 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 tell you a little bit about our our great corner here. We are in one corner of the of the of the Sea Baltic Lab, and we are working on a experimental project. We hope that will be uh, up next uh, spring, and it's called Open Forest. It's something we are also doing together with the colleagues at RMIT in which we are trying to think about the, the relationship between the forest, uh, data, and all kinds of entanglements that relate to uh, you know, climate, climate crisis and, and sustainable transitions. Basically, we are toying with this idea about the, all kinds of data that are being harvested, gathered, generated from different kinds of forests, and how can they tell us about creating new relationships between um, people, scientists, uh, trees, and all the beings that populate the forests. So what we have done here, market. <laughs> yeah, so I would maybe also just say that what Andrea already said, we are trying to sort of also experiment with these more than human perspectives that we can possibly take as researchers, uh, looking, uh, looking at the environment around us. Uh, so the forest really was for us very interesting environment where to do that uh, and sort of start from kind of collaboration with the trees <laughs> looking at not only you know what kind of data can we get from the trees but also what possibly the trees can think about us in the way of you know how is the human activity on trees and around trees projected onto them and how does it influence the data that the trees can then possibly give us so yeah yeah no that at the moment we're working with a uh... A research forest in the north of Finland and what we have gathered here is some of the initial materials we have pictures and quotes and then we are just basically now working together through the stories uh, towards building the experimental production in the spring yeah so just so you uh, like have a better imagination of what the forest is like for me it was for instance something quite new because I moved to Finland quite recently the research forest the several parts and one of them is this kind of high-tech forest where the trees are strapped with all kinds of sensors measuring you know to measure atmospheric reactions to gather all kinds of gases aerosols in the air in a very long time so it is very like high science saturated high-tech research environment so like that sort of provoked also that idea of what do these trees strapped by these human-made instruments how do they actually live there together in the forest and you know uh, mm -hmm. how are all these flows of data enacted there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Now, now we're just have using the Baltic Sea Lab as an excuse to start thinking about, about some of those uh, themes for the, for the future. And, and, uh, yeah, so you can also, well, it's just for illustration, but what we have set up here in this like little layer, <laughs> this little crate, it's more meant like a workshop. It's a working station for anyone who is interested uh, in this kind of research uh, and explorations, including us. Uh, so rather than, you know, art installation, like finished art installation, it's more of a working space for people to come read articles, look at our resources that we have so far, go through the quotations that we have sampled so far from the scientists working in the, in the Hitiala forest, in the Finnish forest, uh, and also read their feedback. So we have, it's very like, you know, DIY low tech working station where anyone can come 
pandemic restrictions allowing, of course, uh, and engage with, with this topic. Yeah. And and uh, we'll hope then to link that a little bit later to the to an urban forest in Melbourne, where where we hope our colleagues uh, Jazz and Anna and Christina will build build upon this work, and you will hear more about that later. Uh, but now uh, we we would also like to open it to uh, questions and other comments that you have, and otherwise just Namkyu, Julia, and me will continue our conversation about how we see the development of the space and what it allows uh, for the we, we are still here until when julia uh, uh at least until the end of january maybe longer if we uh, if they don't find a tenant So uh, I can see that there are already some questions in the chat and there is already some uh, conversation uh, evolving. So maybe we can uh, start from there. There was a question from from Stella and from Kat and I see that uh, Julia already responded. So maybe Julia, do you want to bring this up? The conversation started there. Yes, I think, I mean, the conversation we started was this whole idea of stewardship uh, systems and it's something that I think can play such a great role because if you feel that you are a steward of something, you suddenly feel empowered to act on what you kind of what you see and all. And, and in a way, there is the care with stewardships that you can kind of build on. Um, so then I answered the question with these stewardship systems that we started to look at to figure out how we can, um, in a way, I don't know, drive, drive um, a more caring attitude to our ecosystems we rely on. So what I noted is that actually um, every time there is an ecological imbalance, there is a social imbalance following straight after. So in a way, the attempt is to try and address both of these together and heal them and by empowering some of the, of the local people to be sea stewards. But then the idea is, it doesn't, it doesn't just work when you name them as sea stewards, because you need to then say, well, what do they need? What tools do they need to actually fulfill that role? Because otherwise it's very unfulfilling. And, and who do they need to be heard by? So then you need to build that infrastructure between them and the scientists, for example, whom they could help to address some of the issues. Or so, so for example, when I go to the beach on a sunny day and I see there's a big algal bloom, I just go home and think, oh my God, there's a big algal bloom. But could there be somebody I can alert about this? Or could there be somebody who would value me to kind of swoop up some of this algal bloom and have it? So there's a lot of citizen science connections, I think, where you empower people and give them the tools to actually uh, help, help you build the knowledge you need to address that topic. Thank you, Julia. I think there's also one question from Stella uh, about the seed agency. Stella, maybe would you like to uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Okay. Feel free just to say it out loud, Stella, please. If you're there. Uh, sure. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, um, and nice to see familiar faces. Um, yes, uh, um, the funny thing is I started uh, uh, drawing it, then the figure, and then I realized I had no space left for the C and it ended up right at the very <laughs> end of the page. <laughs> and then I realized, oh, wait, what's the C do? And I, that's how I noticed that uh, I didn't see anything there. Um, but uh, I'm... I, I, I'm totally sure it's not overlooked. I was just curious why in this figure uh, the sea wasn't doing anything. Well, there is in a way, it's only a little bit, it's still so far just a sketch, but it's true. There is, it's see, care for, monitor and engage with, and the monitoring in a way is kind of, of course, asking the sea question and the sea answers, but that is not really drawn yet. It should be added, I think, this, in a way, the sea answering back still a bit human-centric but i guess these are the ways in which we are engaging 
I mean, you know that there's a that there's a big uh, initiative called the Parliament of Things, and they're engaging, but they're engaging with the North Sea of Things very much at the moment. I've seen their um, I've seen their artwork in Broken Nature exhibition, where also one of the pavilions was shown, um, and that would be super great, for example, as one of the topics. You know, if they're now in the North Sea, maybe there can be something that can be brought here or something, but. I mean, what I find interesting there is somehow everyone, like I also build with this department of seaweed, I built my own little uh, thing and I'm trying to build a big network, but then there are already so many really great practices that I think would live a lot bigger and wider and, and more if we could uh, enact them in different places in different localities because so Loca location specifics. So this is what we would like to do, to go beyond my own practice or our own department of seaweed practice and see whether there are some people. So for example, we, we created an exhibition in the design museum last year called Critical Tide. And we tried to bring in different positions by designers and artists around um, the ocean and around, and, and all of the positions were something where the exhibition visitor would go away and feel empowered to do something, to get engaged and so forth. So there was one project there called Ocean Confessions, which was a little bit something that Namkyu now built on with these um, kind of confessions. The idea that you are relating your own deeds to, uh, to the ecosystem and then you are, first of all, seeing in dialogue with others. You're seeing, you're understanding your impact and you are becoming aware of your impact and then you have a moment of connection with the ocean, for example, that lets you engage with it on an emotional level. So I think it's always this intellectual and emotional woven together that will create this powerful moments that I think are, are important. So the idea is now to go to these guys, and there are two guys that are actually from Vancouver and that um, study now in Eindhoven. And they came over for the exhibition to set it up and to hold the ocean confessions here in Helsinki. But then we were collecting confessions throughout the exhibition and they couldn't fly back and they didn't make sense for them to fly back. So then I, in a way, enacted their artwork. I took the visitors of the design museum and all the confessions to the ocean. We discussed how to do it, but there was a little bit of leeway that I could make it my own, but it was still their project and it was very much presented as their project. And that was such a great moment of enabling these practices to merge and to be activated in places without us flying all around the world, even more important now with COVID and so forth. We just can't be the transporters and go to all these places to enact the practices, but the practices would be great to be in different locations and happen not just in a local context. And so we're trying to do that. Uh, Julia, perhaps you can take out the Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Good. There was another one about the the interest you have seen in the stewardship program in Finland. Maybe Kat can ask out loud. Yes, if she's here. To elaborate. Hey guys. <laughs> sure. Um, my my camera isn't working, so apologies that I'm just a discombobulated head at the moment. But um, I, I was just wondering how much interest you've seen in the stewardship program. Uh, in Finland so far because I, I was just thinking there are probably so many people uh, you know I know when I lived near the ocean in Vancouver I was always thinking I wish I could do some sort of ocean program or join a club of ocean enthusiasts but I never knew where to look so so I guess I wonder how, how are you getting the word out and how are people finding out about this work it's just starting so and uh, you're very welcome to be that uh, Vancouver-based <laughs> connection once we got the Baltic cover, it would be wonderful. Um, it's just starting, I mean, through the work we did before with the Critical Tide exhibition and my Department of Seaweed, I'm quite well connected in the Baltic region with, um, for example, uh, the Submariner Alliance that are running these EU-funded um, projects that connect um, blue growth economy um, players with the knowledge they need in, in a network, basically. So for example, they were really excited about the Department of Seaweed, also about this kind of um, ocean literacy that they're also super interested in. And, you know, it, it, it meets on many points, but the Sea Stewards 
itself is just starting. So we're just literally now starting to send the emails out to invite people to have these interviews in January and then connect further. I can't yet say whether people will run our door in or not. At the moment, they don't because we haven't yet kind of made it big enough. Hopefully, hopefully they will. I think, I think there's a huge need for people to feel that they can do something. Everyone's getting so frustrated with hearing all the news and feeling impotent about actually making a change happen. So, yeah, thanks for that, Julia. I was also thinking, like, while listening to you now uh, about the NAMQs contribution, uh, I was always, I actually never asked you before, you know, what kind of confession are you actually getting from people? And are they somehow maybe reflecting what Julia is mentioning? Because, like, it's you're talking about fashion, which is a huge sustainability issue. But also now it's like interestingly framed within the C lot, within the C context. So I was just curious what are people confessing to? I think the, the so I haven't really go deeper into the all the detailed matter, but the, as long as I understood so far, it's very much about very sometimes very silly in a way, like the ah, I bought a pair of some sneakers and then as a follow up makeover. I will donate some of the unused shoes that I have in my closet or something like that. So to be precise, I don't think it's like all related to C, but very much, I mean, the idea of C, you know, the, that comes and goes and is so like in a way generous, but at the same time wild. So in a way that they are just using this opportunity to talk about different matters relating to fashion and different issues that they may have done in their practice, or if they are not involved in any fashion related matter, then they are talking more from their consumption habit or, you know, behavior and et cetera. It's interesting in that sense that fashion, you can both talk about on the, you know, the transformations we need to do are both, both at the level of the consumption and at the practice practice themselves are very also complex and yeah. not so much discussed. Yeah, in a way, the fashion, I think, the, compared to Julia's uh, work, I think the, the main difference is that I address the problems within, in a way, the system of fashion, because I, I believe I, I, I'm encountering more and more like there's a conflict and like many issues. And of course, that means, in other words, potential to make transformation in in relation to i mean through creative pro practices more pra innovative and creative approaches to address those issues within the system of fashion is needed so it's a like just flipping the way of thinking from framing as a problem to not solution but opportunities I think that I think one topic is also that's always coming up again is to make people realize that in the end everything is connected to the sea. So this is part of this ocean literacy in a way. So for example, the critical tide exhibition we had uh, an exhibition exhibit showing uh, hair mats, and they are by um, uh, matters of trust in the U.S. and they are basically tightly uh, kind of felted mats of human and animal hair that they get for free from the salons. And they felt it in a way that it fits into the storm drains of the gutters of the city, because a lot of the problems we have with um, detritus getting into the ocean is actually from the rain going through the gutters, all the little um, particles from the streets, and then actually washing straight into the sea. So hair itself acts as a trap for the oil and for all the, you know, all the toxins that come from the tires and so forth. And then on that hair mat, in the end, you can then grow fungi and basically make another loop without it going to the ocean and being dispersed first. So I think one of the tasks really also maybe with the fashion and with everything is to actually maybe show that link and show people who live far away from the ocean that they still have an impact on the ocean by what they do every day. <laughs> the connections seem to be multiple uh, and at multiple uh, levels. We have also now.
sorry, I muted myself again. <laughs> There's one from Christina about the about the how what others that are working with the forest have been thinking about what we are doing. And um, what do you think? Sort of anecdotal stories. Well, maybe like just some, maybe like a little bit entertaining uh, anecdotes from uh, like the responses or, uh, you know, the, 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 the stories from the scientists that we have gathered so far. Uh, I really like that one uh, remark by someone when we were asking, uh, you know, like the, the, the trees are giving the scientists data in a very long term. Uh, and sometimes the, like over the time, the data just becomes more and more unreliable, which the scientists uh, term as the trees are starting to give bad data. And so we were wondering this and just like, why? Like, you know, what happens? Like, wh how, why is the tree giving bad data? And the scientists were saying, well, because they are tired, because they've been strapped with sensors for such a long time. So they are just tired. They are, you know, it's just not good anymore. So that kind of brought us also to this sort of like more than human perspective of, okay, so this may be like a sign or like example of what is the tree thinking or how is the tree sort of like, yeah. you know, not thinking, I'm like overdoing reacting. it, but <laughs> reacting to the human activity. Uh, so, you know, we use them, we need the trees to do a lot of stuff for us, of course, in terms of like carbon sequestration and wood production, things like that but also in terms of providing us the data about the atmospheric reactions and about like the larger uh, atmospheric context yeah. of climate change. But then if you think about the tree as an instrument, you should also care for the instrument if you want to get the good data, good data. From yeah, the but tree the, all, all those kinds of relations see, are certainly at the, probably at one of the key points on to, to look at uh, and to see what what do telling different stories about that would mean for for a general understanding of how we should relate to other entities to knowledge production in general and to all kinds of sorts that, that yeah we'll need to poke poke at and and i hope that for example the experiments we can do here in in this forest and in the urban forest in melbourne can help us kind of entangle some of those some of those also thinking also about what the, the work of Julia has been doing and the, you know the, the the way also kelp grows in forests and you know there's relationships between between things and, and in, in, in different different levels try yeah. to draw those connections together also at some point yeah like there's also like the forest is such a rich area for you know explorations like that because you also have to think about the soil which is the ground matter pretty much for everything and also about the mycelium connecting the trees uh through the soil so i think that like it's really super rich environment for for looking at these entanglements but also back to the point what julia said at the beginning how important it is to be materially involved physically involved uh with the matters around us uh, this is also something that we have heard from the scientists working in the forest so far that it is very important for them to actually be there even if you're asking so what like you have a sensor here you can sit at your computer in helsinki and you can look at the data streams and make some conclusions and one of the scientists was saying but that's absolutely different thing that doesn't work like that if you are actually here and you walk through the forest as well and you also get this sort of less like hard science defined perspective on the environment, uh, it changes your, you know, your view of the of the whole environment. So it's again this very like the material aspect, yeah, sensorial aspect of being there is very important as well. Uh, there is one also, Anna. Would you like to elaborate your question for for Julia? Yeah, sure. It's amazing to see all of your work from all the different angles. <laughs> and actually, it was, it was interesting. I, I wish I could actually be there to smell it. I hadn't actually considered that the installation would um, smell like the sea as well. Uh, Julia, I was really keen to just ask if, um, if you could share a little bit more about how audiences, how you'd found audiences sort of encountering or engaging a work in uh, maybe across the, the various kind of um, presentations you've had of it and um, and I was also keen to know um, a little bit more about how you'd facilitated these particularly future conversations um, 
with with visitors to the work too. Yes. <clears throat> um, maybe the my second question first. Maybe these future conversations. Um, so I, I wrote about this a bit in my PhD. If you're interested, you can find it on the Royal College of Art website. So my background is more, <coughs> sorry, my background is more in speculative design. But then I felt now when I'm working with the seaweed that this really wasn't enough, that a lot of speculative design really lands in this very dystopian, you know, almost like warning you of this or that future rather than helping you go towards the future. So in a way I combined my work with transition design, which is something I really believe in, that we are uh, should not just design for the now, but actually think of our designs as on a trajectory, on a pathway towards the future, and that we should find a future that we want to be on the pathway towards, and then backcast and think, okay, what steps help towards that and not. So it's in a way extending our frame of vision into you know, from the immediate or two year or five year into like a 30 year visioning where we're going. And I think if you combine the two, because that's also what speculative design does, you have this very rich breadth of um, possibilities that you can enact. So what I was doing is in the department of seaweed in the Victoria and Albert Museum, I wasn't presenting um, a finished object. I wanted to present that whole scope from not knowing to sensing to testing to building prototypes and so forth and that was what people saw when they came to the department of seaweed and because i didn't see one finished object they were trying to imagine what objects we might be making but they were all imagining from their vantage point so they were imagining completely different objects but because we were there we had this dialogue then so so it was basically that the object on show was a lens through which people looked from their different viewpoints into a future that they imagined. And then we were there to have this discourse about raincoats. And then one person was like, oh, what about, could you make raincoats? And then we we're like, yeah, okay, what would it take? When, where would it make sense? And then we were putting all these relations there of the Inuit raincoats that are displayed in the um, British Museum that are made of uh, intestines and you know all these kind of things but so we were envisioning we were almost like standing next to that person who had just proposed something and then imagining it together and that seemed to be a super super nice way of engaging people and having them think from their own perspective so connected to their own life and to their own story and to their own abilities as well um what is harder then is to build on that because that moment of connection is that one kind of like wow great and then what then you know then you need to build a platform where people can continuously engage and interact if they want to if they don't want to you know that's fine but i think this platform building is something that is very difficult if you are just one person or even with a lot of the funding instruments that are always like aimed at one target, at one outcome, but the platform is something that doesn't end. You're building it and it grows and it becomes further. And at some point, maybe it needs to fund itself. But but I think that is the harder point. So this is the, this futuring together or imagining futures together. Because I think there's such a pull in that, you know, this, um, I, I looked at um, communities of practice where people uh, have an interest in collaborating to to reach some future. And what was the first question? <laughs> I was just oh, saying, what encountered. Yes. Yeah, just <clears throat> how people have encountered, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's super interesting what perspective people bring. You never, like, I never thought of what connects <clears throat> with the seaweed on which levels. So people sent me pictures from their childhood beaches where they went to people took away some seaweed and embroidered it on it and sent some parcels back. People, you know, there was one super interesting conversation. So uh, a seaweed producer, seaweed grower, heard of this and came and visited the Department of Seaweed. And he was saying that they had just signed a big contract with a manufacturer that makes uh, ready meals. And they had, they were supplying all the seaweed for this manufacturer that makes ready meals and supplying this health food market of almost like pills, like food supplements. And essentially it was the same seaweed and was doing exactly the same job, 
in the fast food, it was kind of reducing salt content, sugar content, giving more flavor with less of the bad ingredients. But they had to sign a non-disclosure agreement that they would never publicly uh, state that they are actually supplying uh, seaweed to that company. And the seaweed was hidden under some kind of e-number or kind of number in the thing because they were so scared that their clients will not buy the product anymore if they know there's seaweed in it. And so, so these kind of conversations reach far beyond the realm of what do we do next with the seaweed, but they all build a big picture in which the seaweed is center stage. And they all enable people to actually look beyond the human frame and from the capacity of the seaweed, what does it afford? What does it enable? What, you know, how, how can we almost like help the seaweed to be at its best and to kind of do what it naturally does, maybe even more. <laughs> Fascinating. We're five minutes to to finish, so uh, we are up to last question <clears throat> or conversation started. If anybody's burning with something. Otherwise, maybe we can end up with a short reflection of of how this this I think that there's um, a lot of kind of intimacy in all these kind of conversations our works are calling for, and these new circumstances kind of chops that intimacy. <laughs> there's a lot of challenges in creating these conversations uh, under Zoom uh circumstances so how, how do we see the the work ahead uh next year what, what's in there for your for your work uh, julia thinking that we cannot talk so easily i think we need to walk together with people i think we need to still do as much as possible in real life meeting walking alongside each other. I think there is a lot of metaphors around, you know, having dialogues, not facing each other, but both facing in the same direction, walking next to each other. And I think that's a metaphor and also a necessity in times of COVID. And we should have a lot of these yeah. together with people. <laughs> Molly, Molly, we are going to give you the, the last, uh, the last chance for the, you've been, you've been posing so nice questions. We, we should hear you last. Oh, I'm just so excited. Sorry to pepper you with comments and questions. I just love, I love all of this work so much. Uh, I just wonder because, um, you, Julia, your comment about the platforms was so apt. It's like we, we build this awareness and then what next? Like, what do people do with these ideas and these experiences from these, these creative engagements, encounters they have? And I've been thinking a lot about like, what, what is the real power of these things that we're making? And, and does it have to be leading to this action? Are we responsible for that? Is there some way of building, uh, building on the engagement to include more reflexivity so that people are maybe aware of the power they're building in themselves through these encounters, that, that they're aware of, of having this changed idea and then they're, they have more agency to go and seek these platforms themselves and make these connections. So we don't, you know, as artists, maybe we don't need to make sea steward program, but we, we can in, engender uh, the awareness that people have that they can go out and seek things like sea steward. I, I love that program and I think it's gonna be amazing, but just this as an example of thinking through this idea. So I wonder if you have comments about that or am I totally off base or, you know, so. No, you put your finger onto something really, really good because I now, I've been working with seaweed for uh, 12 years almost. And people are sometimes like, yeah, but you know, your department of seaweed, it talks about something and then it's still so small. And yes, I wish it was now bigger. But at the same time, I also have to think, where do I put my time? Where do I put my energy? Where do I put my 24 hours? And with this, in a way, I think it's grown hugely, but not necessarily as Department of Seaweed. It's grown in spirit in other people's engagements with the ocean. Now suddenly there were some um, Eco Design Awards uh, of the Nordic countries. I forgot the name. But anyway, both, both major awards went to seaweed 
projects and I was like okay great you know this is it's growing it's growing and it's growing with that spirit of sustainability not necessarily growing where I am but it is it is happening but I still would like to grow it because I think <clears throat> especially at Alto this is such a perfect spot for a really research oriented platform like this where I'm building together on the knowledge that is here with biomaterials, with chemistry, on the connection, very, very strong connection with design, on this whole idea of more than human-centered design, of engaging um, policymakers and so forth. It's like the perfect spot. And I should be able to build a big seaweed lab here, but, you know, it's like, where do I grasp first? What do I, you know, where do I hold on? Where, where do I, I don't know, maybe I just also need some other partners who know the other sides on the other positions that I'm not so good at. And then you had a second point that I wanted to ask to. Yeah, I mean, I think this, <clears throat> this um, I got a little bit cross with designers doing TED Talks and then leaving their projects to fester. You know, it's like, I, I uh, <clears throat> even wrote a paper together on this with Claire Brass from, uh, <clears throat> from the UK and <clears throat> Sorry, I need some water. It's so dry here. The the whole um, topic was it takes a village to raise a child. So I started to see um, these transition design projects as babies. And in a way, in our design education, very often we are taught how to give birth to really beautiful, aesthetic, wonderful, perfect conceptual babies. But we ha we're not really necessarily being taught how to raise them into adults that they need to be to have impact in society. Now the question is, should we as designers be the ones that are raising them? Or how can we have communities that help us do that? Because it takes a village to raise a child, basically. So who are the teachers? Who are the mentors? Who are the doctors? And so forth. Everyone's coming to the old movie. <laughs> yes. So it's two o'clock. And I think we are basically done. Thank you for joining us. Um, yes. You can take the somebody take the rap picture. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I hope <laughs> and, uh, you can follow follow more of the adventures of the Baltic Sea Lab and the fashion confession and the forest, the forest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, through the website of the project and the Twitter feeds and uh, and creatures and creatures. Yeah, the the websites of creatures. Yes, yes. sure. Thank you for your great comments. It was really, really, really nice discussion that was started like this. <laughs> Thanks a lot for, uh, for your presentations and for all the work. It was great to hear more about what you're doing. <laughs>